So my name is Tan Lee. I'm one of the, the orthopedic traumatologists here at Regions for the past uh, six years. So uh, today we're going to talk about evaluation and acute management of pelvic uh, fracture. Mainly I'm going to focus on the first 12 hours in terms of emergency care as well as the early period uh, when they go to the intensive care unit or when they get the CT scan and other um, modality that may be needed. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. This is my disclosure slide. Just as you see in the emergency department as well as up on the ward, you know, there are very interesting patients that you see with big traumatologists that you see the same thing. It's uh, something that I kind of noticed as a surgeon that there are some warning signs that uh, that you see in patients that uh, may be beneficial to be aware of and help you better take care of them. And, uh, a lot of the patients, uh, if you see this warning sign, they may call they with a little bit longer hospital stay. They may need a little bit more, more narcotic uh, pain medication, they need a little bit more time when you're rounding on them. Uh, so it's unpublished data, but uh, as we start out with this, uh, I'm sure you probably encounter most of these patients. The first warning sign is, Personal blanket and pillow. <laughs> so it just means that it's the uh, Regents Hospital, it becomes Hotel Regents for uh, maybe a week or so. The second one is the uh, anxiety dog. <laughs> the point to understand is because sometimes this may be the best form of pain control. So if you're changing the, the dressing or you're pulling a drain or something, and you know they often have a stuffed animal, a lot of times it if they have it, it's probably the best form of pain control. And probably the last one that's uh, probably the most uh, alarming is the washcloth. <laughs> be aware of that. I think that, uh, by being aware of that, uh, the outcome is actually pretty good. So we'll move on next to the, uh, the top with regards to the pelvic. We'll look at the stable as well as unstable, mainly focusing on the unstable pelvic fracture that you often will see. We'll just do one slide on the stable pelvic wing. Um, this is often the elderly patients, patients that fall from a standing height. If, un if they're unable to put weight on it, they will either get a hip fracture, some on neck, or an intertrochanter fracture. Or the other, if they don't have that, is a pelvic uh, fracture right through the vein mine. So it's important to understand that they often isolate injury. The, the, they don't need surgery, however, the biggest issue is going to be the comorbidities uh, with regards to the medical aspect uh, that needs to be taken care of. Uh, the one thing to be really alarmed about is I would recommend uh, checking the hemoglobin initially when they come in and then probably about six hours later until it's stable. A lot of times the elderly patient will have sclerotic vessels, so uh, they actually will um, uh, tear a little bit of that and they have tendency to bleed. A couple of studies have shown that uh, the average uh, blood transfusion is about two to four units uh, for even a stable pelvic ring in the elderly. So I would recommend uh, giving hemoglobin and checking again in six hours. If it's uh, stable, then you don't, you don't need to do anything more. But if it's unstable, uh, meaning it drops down, then uh, transfusion may be quite. So the next one we'll talk about, and mainly the focus of this talk will be the unstable. This is what you often will see down in your uh, trauma bay, this is TPA. High energy mechanism, more vehicle accident, motorcycle accident. They will often have uh, other associated injuries uh, that can be life-threatening. The key here is if, if the pelvis is an open injury, the mortality can be almost it's up to 50%. It just goes to the high energy of the injury that you have to be aware of. Often, from a sports standpoint, they will need surgical intervention. The objective here today is look at the pelvic ring in terms of acute assessment. What are some of the mandatory physical examination? What are some of the imaging studies that should be uh, looked at and how to look at them initially to predict, is this patient gonna do poorly? <laughs> is this patient gonna bleed? Is this patient gonna be fine without any further intervention? And that will go through all of that. And it's going to be a team approach from the emergency department faculty to the trauma tax service to the orthopedic as well as other service that we'll talk about that's going to be very crucial in managing them. Finally, we're going to look at what are some of the temporization measures. And the main one we're going to focus on is the public binder. And it's a huge um, modality that we can use to help uh, with resuscitation of the patient. And I'll show you 
how to actually properly put it on and how it's going to really help with the um, recovery. Quick slide on the anatomy. The key thing is not just the bony pelvis. The key st stability to the pelvic ring is the ligament just, uh, that you do not see on the x-ray. Uh, as you can see here, the pubic symphysis anteriorly You can see the pubic symphysis anteriorly, uh, where you often see if it's disrupted, that means that that's the open book that you often describe. Uh, and then the other important thing is the posterior elements, the ligament that's on the back side, if that's disrupted, then, then it really means that this pelvis is very unstable, not just rotational, but also vertical instability as well. So the anterior pelvic ring account for about 40% of the stability and it's mainly rotational. So if they tear this ligaments right there, it opens up. And if they tear the ligaments right here, the pelvic floor, it opens up more and it becomes more unstable. And as, as they externally rotate more, it can also disrupt the posterior elements, making the pelvis much more unstable. And we'll look at the AP pelvis, which will give you pretty much all the information you need initially to determine is this pelvis going to bleed or is this pelvis going to be okay? Classification won't get too indefinite, but uh, it may be helpful to understand your T-bone, which is your lateral compression, the anterior posterior, your open book, and what are the chances of those pelvis? Is this one going to bleed? Is this one going to have more of a head injury? Is this one going to have abdominal injuries? And they actually get a correlation that certain mechanism will correlate with more blood loss, associated injury, as well as mortality. So when you look at the lateral compression, which is on the left side, they're less likely to bleed. That's your T-bone, it comes across. And I'll show you in a little bit why that's the case. The anterior com posterior compression, which is your open book pelvis that you see, is where the pelvis externally rotate, and I'll show you a slide where the vessels are on tension, so they're more likely to bleed and you can see that the transfusion rate is higher. So when you see that, you can pretty much anticipate that they're gonna need type of cross and blood immediately. So the anterior posterior compression, like I said, most of the time it's gonna be hemorrhage. And that's what they're gonna cause a lot of death. Whereas the lateral compression is the associated head injury, abdominal injury from the T-bone. So be really aware of that when you're looking at the CT scan. So this is your lateral compression. T-bone, you see the arrow coming across there. You see the pelvic floor, it's, it's relaxed. The, your major vessels are not on tension and, and they're less likely to bleed. So this is the lateral compression type one. You can see the force coming from the left side and causing a buckle factory. You see back here, the buckle back here, pretty stable factory uh, injury. As you get across the spectrum where there's a fractured dislocation of the SI joint on the left side, it becomes a little bit more unstable. And then this is your wind swipe injury, where the car comes across, internally rotate, cause a fractured dislocation of this side, and as it goes across, it causes external rotation of the other pelvis. And this is something that is much more unstable, more likely to bleed. In addition to that, it's, uh, it's unstable that needs surgical intervention. So, so that's your loud compression that you often will see. How about the, the open book one, the one where you, the motorcycle where they hit a pole and it comes anteriorly at you, causing the hemi pelvis on one side, which you see on, the, on that right side, externally rotate. You see the vessel right here? As it comes down, it's on tension. So it's gonna open up, it's gonna disrupt the vein and the uh, arterial uh, and bleed. And then you can see See, this is the angio showing the aorta to the iliac vessel, and then track one. And you see the superior gluteal artery as it comes around the sciatic notch. And so you can imagine when you look on this on AP pelvis, winding right here, and then that side is completely wide. You can imagine that that pelvis is going to bleed, and it may need to go to angio. So uh, just an AP pelvis is amazing how you can get a lot of information from, uh, from it to help uh, resuscitate the patient. So your type one uh, anterior posterior where the pubic symphysis opens up only about 2.5 centimeter. They actually did a study where 
if it only opens up 2.5 or less, that means that the public floor is still intact. The chance of bleeding is less likely. It doesn't need surgery. Whereas it opens up more than 2.5 centimeters, what they did was they sectioned the ligament of the pubic symphysis and then they sent it to the pelvic floor. And they found that if you session the pelvic floor with this, it opens up greater than 2.5 centimeters. So that tells you that that pelvis is likely unstable. And then, and then the type three where it essentially externally rotate more, causing disruption on the backside, leading to increased stability. So that's how you can kind of look at the, the pelvis. And then this is your jumping from a wobble shot bridge or height wise, whereas the vertical shear, where they break the front and the back and makes it very unstable uh, with regards to that. You can imagine, remember that vessel I told you come down here is on tension. So that's how I, I would tell my ortho resident, you need a traction pin because you want to pull that pelvis down to untent the vessel and the nerve and the and nerve that comes around it. So that's, that's the one that needs the traction pin instead, it, more so than the pelvic binding. So this is the main talk of this in terms of multi-disciplinary uh, approach from the emergency department to the trauma service uh, to the orthopedics. We're way down here in terms of you know managing the pelvis when we get the call, but it's important to get neurosurgery and urology and other services involved as needed. And we're going to go through all of, all of those um, injuries as well as the uh, them involved. So the key is identify which pelvis is going to be unstable. Some of it from your clinical examination is the leg externally rotated. Uh, you feel the pelvis is unstable. Looking at the AP pelvis, uh, uh, I show, is this going to likely to bleed or is this going to be fine? So it's important to identify which pelvis is going to be at high risk of bleeding so that you can intervene early. So the mandatory physical examination that I always tell the residents, check the perineum, looking for any laceration, any or labor uh, swelling, which tells the, the high energy of the injuries. Uh, as you can see, this nine-year-old was actually transferred from an outside hospital uh, with, with staples here. So anytime I see a fracture, I see a laceration next to a fracture, I have to consider that to be an open injury, because <coughs> the risk of an infection open pelvis is nearly 50% if you don't uh, intervene quickly. And then the other thing you should look for is uh, degloving type of injury, abrasion, and, and that, that can occur that can also lead to infection as well. And then certainly the other uh, mandatory is to check the rectal, vaginal, neurologic as well as associated fracture, which we're going to talk about this patient you see as a pelvic but also bilateral tibial plateau uh, fracture as well. And then also a degloving type of injury right here uh, with regards to all the injuries there. So here's your AP pelvis. You can look at that and see there's a fracture through here. You can see, you know, it, there's, there's no external rotation of pelvis. It's not migrated in any way. So you, and you look, you know, that was just a fall from a standing height. So that's low energy, that's unlikely to be unstable. Uh, but the one where you see the open book, uh, the, where the hemi pelvis is externally rotated, motorcycle accident, then you have to anticipate that's a very high energy, it's likely unstable and may need uh, further intervention. So this is how I look at the pelvis. You look for symmetry. So you can see on the AP pelvis, this is really all the information you need initially. I know a lot of times orthopedic will ask for inland out of view, which will show you. That helps with the management of it, but AP publish will tell you that you have superior inferior vein line fracture. <coughs> this is what alarms me. When you see the calm minutia, that means that there's a high energy type of injury and it is likely leading to more instability of the pelvis. And you see that this right hemi pelvis is, is severely migrated as compared to the left side, and the other thing you look for is this ilium is much wider, so it's, you imagine that the leg, left side is quite externally rotated as compared to this side, so. The inlet we get is mainly looking at, is there any, an, this is posterior, this is anterior. So you can see that <coughs> the right hemi pelvis is, here's the SI joint here that looks a little bit no, normal, but you can see here, 
that should be right there. So you can see that the right hemicarbus has been dislocated posteriorly, and, and, uh, and as well as uh, this outlet view, which shows is there any migration of the hemicarbus. So this person is likely to be shorter on the right side, and that's where I, I would ask the resident to put a traction pin in. And what that's helpful is that it can pull the pelvis forward and inferiorly so that it untent the vessel as well as the nerve that can be uh, injured. And a CT scan for further uh, delineation, often the, in a trauma patient, they'll have those CT scans done already. And that helps show the backside of the pelvis a lot better. You can kind of see, when I just look at the this here, there's so much bowel gases and all, say, all those uh, structure that it's difficult to see the backside of the pelvis. So that's why a CT scan <coughs> is beneficial to see if there's a sacral fracture on the backside or not. So be aware of the associated injury. The hemorrhage, nerve, urology, gyne, GI, and soft tissue. So it's pretty much the eyes does not see what the mind does not uh, think. So you have to be really aware of it and try to avoid the tunnel vision that we have. Associate injury, you can see this, AP pelvis showing the open book anteriorly, and you can see that the whole left SI is completely externally rotated, uh, causing the SI um, disruption, and then you see the SI joint on this side is wide, and what else? Left hip dislocation too. So be aware of all those injuries uh, in, in terms of uh, managing the patient. And then the other thing, nice <coughs> thing is they stop the bleeding. They're gonna look for other sources. Some, the pelvis will bleed, but a lot of times you have to check the thorax, abdomen, the head, and all those things because often uh, that's where the source may be. And that's gonna be helpful. Once you've determined that there's no other source of bleeding, then the next question is, can the OTP do something with the bleeding to help um, with the resuscitation? That's where we come in. So it's important to do that. Here's the nerve injury that's important. You can see the L5 and where the S1 comes down. And you see the CT scan showing the fracture dislocation of the left of the left SI where the helium essentially bounces up onto here. So this is very crucial. I, I tell my resident, do a good neuro, neurological <coughs> examination. So don't just say they move the extremity. Uh, I remember this case vividly. It's my, probably my second year. My G2 resident calls me in. They tell me that he's neurologically intact. And I said, do you really assess the, you know, the EHL and all that stuff? And, and he said, they said, yes. And, and they said, I asked him, is it in? They said, yes, it's in. And when you look at that, that's where your L5 is coming down. Chances are not likely. So, so they had to go back, reevaluate, realize, oh, it's not in. Because often they'll just see that, that they're just kind of doing this. You know? So really assess dorsiflexion, which is your L4 plantar flexion, which is your S1, and then EHL, which is your L5, because that's important, because if, if the injury, of, if the nerve is injured at the time of injury, it's unlikely to come back. Whereas, if, after, if it's intact, and after surgery is out, it's more likely to come back, because it's likely from just me retracting the nerve just to get it out of the way to fix the uh, fracture, then that's traction injury, that may come back more so than if it's occurred at the time of injury. So, 
might recall, this is uh, a patient that had the huge chunk of ice block that actually landed on him, causing all of this pressure into his pelvis. And essentially, you know, uh, the pressure was so much that his scrotum actually popped out, uh, leading to a essentially a significant pelvic uh, injury that, that occurred right here in terms of uh, the pelvic ring and the and the surgery is required essentially uh, doing the teaching of trauma fellow orthopedic wise. That was essentially a whole fellowship in terms of every approach and every fixation possible to, to fix that progress over a uh, two day course. And then uh, essentially, this patient is a female with uh, bleeding from the uh, vaginal area. When you see that with this uh, <coughs> book, have to consider that's open, so you have to make sure you get a good speculum examination. <coughs> if need be, get the OB guy involved, and this patient actually uh, uh, I needed the OB guy to repair the laceration of the vaginal vault, as well as urology to uh, help with the uh, repair of the uh, uh, urethra as well. So, so it's quite a significant injury that you have to be aware of. The difficult ones are the, the female patient that's on the menstrual cycle. So if you're alarmed about it, it might be, just don't hesitate to get the OB guy involved to do a spectrum examination. It might take them, you definitely find them to go to the OR, but it can be very difficult to examine on the floor with that, so. And then certainly a GI, the same patient, you know, had abdominal injury, you can see the uh, storm over there as well, so. Soft tissue, degloving injury uh, is important because uh, they had an increased risk of infection if they don't get washed out. How about what are the hemorrhage control or stabilization that uh, you can do down in the city department that actually help with the resuscitation? So the first two is public binder sheet, public <coughs> external fixation. So that's, so that's containment. So the tendency is that the pelvis will open up quite a lot, and our goal is to contain the pelvis so there's a fixed volume so that it can't keep bleeding and it can't, can't keep uh, uh, expanding. And then the, uh, the other down here is more direct control, meaning getting down to the vessel and actually embolizing it or <coughs> probably packing, which is more surgical. Uh, and the main one we're going to talk about is the top, top one. And I'll show some examples of that. So the advantages of public binder is it's easy to apply. You can do it down in the emergency department. Uh, it's portable, meaning that uh, you can move around. And it's a great form to uh, tampon out the decrease of bleeding and essentially prevent gross motion of the pelvis. And you can see it, there's a patient with an anterior posterior compression by about uh, four centimeter, and then you see the clip right there from the public binder closing it down. Uh, the downside about the public binder is sometimes they have to go to an angio or something, uh, it may be difficult to get access to it. But the key is, I'm gonna show you where you should put it. I think the tendency is the sheet is a little bit too high, and I'll show you where uh, to put it ideally. So you can see this patient uh, with the APC winding right there, and you can see that that's the volume, right? And so if you don't put anything on, it's going to keep bleeding, it's going to keep expanding. But if you reduce the hip and then put the pelvic binder on, then you see now it's a fixed volume, so it can expand and actually it helps uh, tampen out. And I'm not so worried about asking my resident to close down perfectly. It's nearly impossible. The key is, even if it's still wide, it's still doing some good because it's not expanding. And, that, and that's the key. It's not so much as getting it perfect, it's getting it so it becomes a fixed volume. So they actually did a study, you know, where they looked at level three, which is right at eight and crest, which is often be put there. And actually that's not a very good force. What, level two is not as good, level one is the best. And that's where I'll show it to you. Level one is as you can see here. That's what you're trying to close down is pubesymphysis. And the direct force right at the greater trochanteric region on each side is where the direct force, and that's going to help close that down. The capacity is put much higher here. And so that doesn't work as well as the one that goes right over the choke and tear region. So you got to put a little bit lower. And if you put it lower, you should be able to get access to the femoral artery and vein and everything. So, so that's, a, that's a study that they did, and they, they noticed that that was the best. 
you have commercial binder that you can use, but really all you need is three or four clamps and a, a, a bed sheet in terms of uh, doing what you need to do. So you can see the force that, that you need to put there, and everybody, you, you can pretty much feel the greater choking and region. So just feel that area, and that's where you want your center of uh, direction wise. I'm actually going to have a video in terms of how it's done. Uh, so it takes about uh, two to three feet. What you don't want to do is is essentially bind it like it, like you're roping a, a calf or something. I mean, and I'll show you a good example of why that's not the way to do things. This is a patient that was initially had it. You can see that essentially it was twisted around like that and then clamped. And this is literally within an hour and a half to two hours, but you see with the uh, wrinkle of it uh, leading to, uh, one, this is too high, and two is too wrinkle and, and, uh, and uh, causing skin problems. So this is the one where if, if I didn't take it off, probably within about six hours, the skin will die and get necrosis. And so this patient that was brought to the office, uh, uh, essentially had the sheet done lower, and you can see it's much more smoother versus that one, uh, which is uh, essentially can cause uh, skin necrosis. And essentially, if you put on a nice one, uh, I, I tell the resident, make sure you check on it, and you can actually leave it on till the next morning. I mean, it doesn't have to be taken off right away. That one needs to be taken off within a couple hours. This one, you can actually leave on till the next day so that the clotting has occurred. So to try it, I mean, this is still a little wrinkle, but still, this is much better. It's nice and try to get the clamp on the side here so that uh, you can get your AP powers as well as other views without the clamps in a way. Plane. Okay. So two people, one on each side, and then you have to pull, to really pull hard in order to see someone else come in and clamp the power. No, you're fine. <laughs> so, so that, that's key. Down low and over the choke enteric regions, as smooth as a sheet as possible. And the other thing is, um, try not to take the, uh, the the leg. I've seen that done too, and and actually I've seen a couple of necrosis of the. Um, of the skin down here, as well as what's also here, the peroneal nerve, right over the, the knee. So I've seen actually people get a, a uh, foot drop because it's uh, essentially uh, the force is too tight over the nerve causing a foot drop. So uh, really all you need is a binder. So the bottom line is, is ideally for those open book or the anterior posterior uh, compression injury, you apply in the emergency department, and, and it's great for resuscitation wise. And I, I see it done a lot where they come in and they're hemodynamically unstable, and probably she just put on. So I, that's fine, that's, that's great. I actually done a study where, where even on the one that's loud compression T bone type, they said it didn't really hurt the patient at all, even if you put the sheet on. So go ahead and put the sheet on. And as soon as you see the AP pelvis and realize that it's a, a loud compression or uh, uh, internal rotation, then you can take it off, you know. But, uh, but that does help with the resuscitation in terms of the decrease of bleeding. And then the key is uh, uh, my resident will come and assess in about six hours to make sure that the sheet is still smooth <coughs> and, 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 then, and then check the hemoglobin again to make sure that it's uh, stable. How about external fixation? This may come into play when when the sheet doesn't function or they, you can't do it because of their body habits or the force is not enough uh, to do so. Uh, and this is maybe beneficial where the orthopedic may need to get involved. And it's nice because, you know, the interventional radiology can, can get access to it, you know, do the, um, get access to the artery and, and investor to do the interventional radiology. So where this is nice is um, I think that any time the trauma service takes somebody to the operating room for an exploratory lab, that's where orthopedic needs to come in and put an X-fix on because with an open pelvis, if you essentially do an exploratory lab 
all the soft tissue, anything that's possible to hold the pelvis together is gone. And so in that situation, I've talked to my colleagues that the, the orthopedic surgeon should come in and put an X fix on uh, in order to uh, help with containment. You can see this is APC, and then with X-Fix, it's, it's closing it down. So it doesn't close down perfectly as a plate, but the key is that it's not going to expand anymore, uh, and you have a fixed volume. So and it's best done in the operating room. So the bottom line here is uh, essentially the ideal is when the trauma surgery is taken from an exploratory lab, and there's an a, a, a anterior posterior compression injury. If the pelvic binder doesn't work, um, Expects may be required, so that, that's, uh, that's the best way to do so. How about the traction pin? I think I show you some X-ray where it's a more vert vertical shear, where one side is higher than the other, and so after uh, pulling it down and reducing it, you can put a traction pin in to help uh, with the uh, untenting the vessel and the nerve that, uh, that is on tension at that time. So this is a classic case. Uh, you can see the left hemipelvis is quite high because they have essentially a vertical unstable pelvis and you can see that with traction and you see those those uh, coils from from the superior gluteal in terms of uh, that was injured so you but the other thing now is the nerve comes down there too so by us doing this it hopefully will decrease any further neurological uh, compromise how about angiography when is there a role for this? I think it, it's very much institutional um, uh, preference-wise, and also is there availability. Uh, we're very fortunate here. I've been at Hennepin, I've seen North Illinois, I've been at Carolina Medical Center, and I have to say, uh, I think we're, we're pretty spoiled, at least from an orthopedic standpoint. I mean, we've got a great emergency department, two attacks, and interventional radiology with other service, so it's very helpful to kind of determine uh, how to best take care of the patient. So in this aspect, uh, I think most of the source of bleeding is from the fracture itself <coughs> or from the vein, but occasionally you have your 15% of the patient where they would benefit from uh, uh, an angiography. I think where the key indication for that is if you see a, a blush on CT, if, if they have, uh, if, even though the pelvic binder's on and everything, you got containment, and they're still hypotensive, the hemoglobin's still dropping, then I think they would uh, be uh, ideal for, for uh, an angiography. So you see the CT blush right here, uh, down, uh, down in the pelvis anteriorly on the right side, so that would be ideal. Uh, however, however, there's a drawback. You can't just, you know, because the hypotensive, just go, go ahead and do that, because it seems like every time they go to, into into radiology, they leave with some type of coil, you know, so. So it's important because if they coil too much, then you can get uh, radial uh, necrosis of the muscle, and they can get other uh, area uh, that can be compromised in terms of blood supply. What about pelvic packing? This is more up to uh, a high level. I think in Europe, it's very common to pelvic uh, pack, and I think uh, Dr. Bendis is uh, with his, you know, military background, he, he does that quite a lot too as well. And <coughs> some institution here like Denver Health, they're pretty aggressive with that. Uh, the key is, is is that, you know, when you do the exploratory lab, uh, you gotta put an X-Fix on first, so there's containment, and then what you wanna do is pack uh, sponges back there, kinda like you do with your damage control in terms of uh, abdominal-wise. So in summary, uh, with pelvic fracture, I know that's quite a, lot to digest and everything, but there's a multidisciplinary approach with uh, essentially um, starting with the emergency department, you know, with the initial care, with the trauma service involved, and then getting the other uh, service. Uh, as I say, I'm just a uh, wide receiver that's part of the team uh, to help uh, win um, and get the patient better. So the key is obtaining the imaging, doing the mandatory test that I talked about, looking at the AP pelvis. Is this patient likely to bleed? Is this patient likely to be in trouble and, and what do uh, and work as a team? I think that's probably the biggest key is communication, you know, from the emergency to the trauma service and, and certainly the orthopedic uh, getting involved because that's our job is to look at it and to, go to notice is this something like to bleed? Is this something that can benefit from uh, external fixation? <coughs>
resident standpoint, uh, you know, I haven't really seen anybody get an external fixator placed. Mm -hmm. How long does that take? If we're, if we have a patient that's not extremely stable, mm -hmm. and we are thinking about getting them back to the SICU, mm -hmm. how long should that procedure take to put the external fixator on? So that depends on the faculty who's doing it. So uh, someone who's experienced in pelvis that puts a lot of those on, it can be you know less than ten minutes. Okay. Um, at some institution, like I think shock trauma, I think they do so much of it that they actually do it in the in the trauma bed. Okay. You know, but in this situation, uh, I think in our OR, we do it in the OR here. But I think the key that's important is. If you're not experienced, and I tell my colleagues who don't do a lot of it, just go ahead and do an open approach. Make a big incision right here, find the air crest, and just shoot two pins down. But I think the most important thing is the tendency is the public bind is on, so it works pretty good, right? And the key is not to take that off and puff and drain. Just leave it on, and, and, and you should have enough space to just prep there, because you're doing damage control, right? Ideally, you want to prep the whole thing out, but. I've seen where you take the binder off, you pop the drip, and, and, and by the time you get back, they bottom out. And so leave the binder on, and then just uh, prep right there and put the pins down, is what I tell my colleagues. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the X fix is going to be there. The external fixer is it more for the anterior stability than the posterior, correct? That is correct, yep. So it's ideal for those anterior posterior compression where, uh, where it opens up anteriorly because. Um, if, it's for the, if the front side is not open, there's no point in doing it. It's, it's more for rotational control. That's correct. <coughs> but with regards to the one where you see the hemi pelvis where they fall from a wash uh, bridge or jump from, and it's one size higher, that doesn't truly benefit from X fix. It actually benefits from a traction hip to pull down the pelvis. So. Um, do you recommend the binder for um, somewhat of a diagonal fracture, like through the rami on one side and the SI joint on the other side, where you do have two unstable sections of pelvis, but they're not the open book? Um, I, I would say that it's ideal for the, you can have rami fracture and, and, um, and actually they can open up. So if there's a gap, then they would be best with a binder. But sometimes, remember those those um, those X-rays are a static view, so it's just a shot in time, so it's not dynamic. So I wouldn't if, if I see that, then I wouldn't put a binder on. But sometimes I've seen those where they can open up more, you know, meaning that uh, uh, even though they've been looking stable, so but they can actually open up. So for example, if you see that they they become hypotensive. Hemoglobin trial, then besides looking for other sources, I would tell the residents to check at AP pelvis again to make sure that maybe the second time you get it, it might have opened up. You know, so. so the sheet is ideally when there's a gap, uh, but it certainly does not hurt if, if it's on for those ones. But I, but you don't, you have to weigh the risk versus the benefit. You know, the benefit probably is not as much with the risk of skin problems with the binder. 